Shakespeare, I think, was the greatest psychologist that the world had ever seen. But he also understood the power of oratory and the power of public speaking. And you, as speakers, as potential speakers, can learn a lot from the world of the theatre. And that's what tonight is all about. To give you some tips about being a performer. Because when you stand up in front of an audience, you enter the world of the performer. The, large, the larger the audience and the shorter the time, the more, more you need performance skills. So what we're going to be exploring tonight are some of the things that I've learnt from the theatre that I've transferred into the world of speaking, particularly when I'm coaching people, when I'm working as a director and helping them to be more like themselves, which is one of the <coughs> things that I do. The world of the theatre is quite extraordinary in that it does play on people's imaginations and it does play on people's emotions and feelings and also the senses. And when you are able to bring those things together in your presentation, then you will be able to connect more with your audience and you'll be able to engage them and maybe even move them. Now Winston Churchill, one of the greatest orators of the last century, says, opening amenities are often opening inanities. <laughs> and what he means by that is all that nice stuff that people go on with is usually pretty inane and it's really pretty pointless. So to be really effective, to get the audience's attention right from the very beginning, you've got to have a startling opening. So that's one of the <coughs> things that we're going to be exploring. The other thing we could explore this afternoon is your personal story. See, the audience need to know what gives you the right to talk about what you're going to talk about? And they want to know what is your personal story? So we've got content, we've got the process. Now you can't do any processes until you're familiar with your content. It means you've got to know your material. You've got to know your stuff. Then you can start playing around with the process. So what you've got to work out with the sort of presentation or speech that you're doing is what is going to be the most effective process for this content that you've got. Now, if you can get more than one process in the presentation, you're going to engage the audience more. Because the audience need change and variety. Your audience's brains need change about every seven to ten minutes. And if you have slide after slide after slide, the brain gets bored with it. When you're going into an event as a speaker, you also need to be aware that you're on before you're on. You're on before you're on. As soon as you said yes, the perception is already out there. The little bit that goes out in the flyer. When you walk in the door, people say, oh, is that the speaker? Oh, oh, that's the speaker. So they're already making judgments and assumptions about you. But the moment you walk out, you're going to either say, oh, yeah, this speaker's going to be interesting. Or oh, they will do boring, boring. I should start thinking about where am I going to go for my holiday? And you've all experienced those sorts of audiences. We call it the lights are on, but nobody's home. They all go off somewhere. So perception is a really, really fascinating area. It is possible to create perceptions. It is also possible to manipulate perceptions. The next thing is... Permission. Two things to do with permission. There is the permission level you get from your audience. See, if your audience actually want to be there, you've got a very high permission level. It's so much easier to connect and engage with an audience that actually wants to be there. Anyone ever tried to run a training program with people who don't want to be there? <laughs> yeah? You know what it's like when you've got a very low permission level. They're still sitting there saying, yeah, come on. Tell us what have you got. And you've got this very low permission level you've got to really work past. We're really hard to break that. But the most important thing for permission with people that I work with and that come in my workshops is the permission that you give yourself. You've got to give yourself permission to be brilliant. You've got to give yourself permission to be a star. You've got to give yourself permission to stand out from the crowd. Because we get so many messages through our growing up and through our education about conform, conform, conform. 
But the permission issue is much bigger for women than it is for men. Uh, women have to deal with, uh, with the permission thing. Because when you think about it, in our culture, in an Anglo-Saxon culture, it is only since about the late 1800s that women actually got the right to vote. Emmeline Pankhurst and the suffragettes, they fought for the right for women to vote. I mean, prior to that, what was a woman's role? She had to look lovely, do the odd bit of embroidery, play the pianoforte, and have children not expected to have an opinion, let alone express one. And now, as women are moving more and more into managerial and leadership roles, they are being asked to now do speeches and presentations. And that little voice pops up and says, but I can't do that, I'm a woman. I have so many women that come in here who are dealing with permission. Now, I suspect that you probably wouldn't be here if permission was an issue for you, but maybe it might be somewhere down there. <laughs>